This is Pamela Smythe from the University of Waterloo. I'm one of the hosts of Beyond the Bulletin, the podcast of internal communications at the university. We bring you news and views from the U Waterloo community. Please spread the word that we're on soundcloud.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And now the interview from episode 164 of Beyond the Bulletin, originally broadcast on December 1st, 2023. The Waterloo Institute for Sustainable Aeronautics, also called WISA, brings together researchers from all six faculties at Waterloo to help make aviation and aeronautics more sustainable. And the work is underpinned by what they are calling three pillars of sustainability, environmental, social, and economic. All are equally important. This year, the Institute received a grant worth nearly $9.2 million from FedDev Ontario to help their ideas take flight. With more on ways interdisciplinary work and learning in sustainable aeronautics can benefit people and the planet, we're joined by Suzanne Kearns. She's a professor in the aviation program and director of WISA. Welcome back to the podcast, Suzanne. Thank you. So you were here back in episode 118, and you provided an excellent overview of WISA and a primer on sustainable aeronautics and WISA's role in helping make air travel more sustainable in so many ways. To help with this work in February, WISA won a grant from Fed of Ontario worth close to $10 million. Yes, we are so grateful and excited. The, the main purpose of the grant uh, through FedDev is through the Aerospace Regional Recovery Initiative, which is money that the government invested to support the aerospace sector in recovering from the impacts of the pandemic. And with WISA launching in 2021, we're only just about two years old, but our proposal was really to imagine what funding could do to catalyze the ecosystem on campus, as well as to foster more connections with industry and small to medium companies as well. What we were able to do is we put out a call for proposals to all of the WISA faculty members. We have about 140 uh, faculty members uh, that are members of the Institute. And we asked them, what would you propose to us that you could um, put together a research project that could have an impact on economic, environmental, or social sustainability? in aviation. And we received nearly 90 proposals from our research teams all across campus. And we put together a, a, a judging panel of academics and industry who reviewed and allocated the funds. And we were able to fund 39 individual research projects, at least one from each of the six faculties across campus and spread across all of those pillars of sustainability. So if, if anybody is interested, you could go to the WISA website under research, and there's a full list there uh, of all the projects. And all of those projects launched in around early March, uh, and they need to be complete by the end of March 2024. So it's just sort of set off this uh, amazing momentum on campus. It's so many different people interacting and, and doing some really exciting work. And we have some other um, aspects of the grant as well, but that was the biggest one. We ended up allocating four and a half million dollars. So when you were here last, you did talk about these three pillars in sustainable aeronautics. Yes, yes. If anybody Googles us, our logo has three bars underneath it. And the reason for that is because that's sort of paramount to our mission. And it's become, I think, increasingly important in aviation because... Well, we saw international aviation agencies about a year ago come together and synthesize behind a net zero by 2050 goal. Well, that's an amazing goal that everybody has agreed on. The challenge is that it has overemphasized the environmental sustainability pillar. And while that has many positive benefits, it, it does have some challenges as well. Uh, some of those you can imagine that if we had a perfectly net zero aircraft, but we had no pilots to fly it or maintainers to keep it safe or controllers to ensure safe separation, society will never realize the benefits of air transportation. And we are facing massive shortages in every aviation professional group today. Hmm. I was recently at uh, an IATA uh, World Sustainability Forum for all the world's airlines, and a gentleman from Mauritius, which is a small island nation, came up, and he said that their country, nearly a third of their GDP is dependent on aviation, and he's really concerned about a future where they implement demand management strategies, like limitations on how, how often people can fly or mm -hmm. or heavier financial burdens that may limit uh, people's ability to travel because 
being a small island nation, historically, they've contributed less to emissions, and they're very dependent uh, on that tourism income. So from that perspective, it's not socially sustainable either. The three pillars are equally important, right? Absolutely. And, and even some of the biggest initiatives. So today, projections suggest that sustainable aviation fuel will be the con- biggest contributor to us achieving net zero targets by 2050. Mm. But the challenge is that sustainable aviation fuel is extremely expensive. The supply chains are not yet mature. Uh, There is a huge amount of work to be done before we could effectively integrate those fuels into, you know, daily airline flights. And those fuels are, are often seven to 10 times as expensive as regular fuel. And and so we start asking the question, well, who's going to pay for that? And how, how is it going to be funded? So it's, it's very multidimensional. And uh, ultimately, a lot of the focus comes down to the idea that aviation is a really hard sector to decarbonize. The, the safety interventions and, and the regulations and you know, all of the atmospheric conditions and, and challenges, uh, that it is uh, not an easy task. Tell me about establishing the, the Innovation Hub. That was $2.5 million, I think, with much of that going towards purchasing three advanced flight simulators. The vision behind it was, what if we had a place where pilots could learn to fly as part of their degree, but simultaneously researchers could be integrated into some of that work in collecting data. And as they're learning to fly, learning more about human learning and human performance and mm. skill development. So the Innovation Hub was a partnership with the Waterloo Wellington Flight Center. The Flight Center is the the group that trains all of our undergraduate student pilots as part of Waterloo's aviation program. So we have a long history of working with them. And we just broke ground on the Innovation Hub a few weeks ago. And the vision behind it is they're actually building an extension onto an existing hangar, and it will create a new sim center uh, that will have three advanced airline caliber flight simulators, a 737, an Airbus A320, and a Q400. The data, all of the data that's generated while students are using that will flow through WISA, and uh, WISA-associated researchers will have the ability to access those simulators for research purposes as well. The solar panels will be there as well, and we're uh, supporting uh, green technologies and and, uh, building materials being used uh, in the Sim Center to help validate some of those and hopefully other uh, flight schools across Canada would be able to take advantage of the what we've learned through that process. Well, WISE is bringing us closer to electric aircraft too. You marked an important milestone in Canada when your two-seater Pipistrel Velas Electro <laughs> took to the air for the first time. Um, now, it's only certified to fly in Europe. You have one. How is that? Yes, so this is the uh, world's first type certified electric aircraft. It is very small uh, because the nature of battery power in aviation right now is that the density of power versus the weight of the batteries means it's only feasible for small aircraft over short distances. But we have been working hand in hand also with the Waterloo Wellington Flight Center and Transport Canada. Uh, This project is led by Dr. Paul Parker, who's been just a real visionary in this space. And um, it's it's an amazing, I guess, illustration of what we hoped WISA would help achieve. We're bringing together academics, industry, and government to produce the data in an operational context that the regulators will need to hopefully certify that aircraft for use in Canadian operations. And once that is achieved, then that would create the guidance and the structure that would allow other flight schools across Canada to then acquire electric planes into their fleets and begin integrating some more green flying. Why is an electric plane so much better than the one that we know? So electric planes, uh, when you look at them specifically for training purposes, it's a good fit. Because when you're training to be a pilot, uh, you're traditionally flying aircraft that are built in the 1960s or 70s in Canada. It's quite an old fleet. Um, And those aircraft burn leaded fuel still, uh, which has environmental impacts. And it's frankly very expensive uh, for young people. So there's a huge financial burden uh, on this young generation of really passionate aviators. And so when we look at an electric fleet, not only is it electric, so there's no emissions, or I think it's 99% less emissions than a traditional aircraft. It's very quiet, um, but also we imagine it being significantly more cost-effective for students. 
Uh, because the aircraft is range limited, it can't be used for everything in training. But even if a percentage of a student's journey is an electric, it can have real benefits. So you're also creating a program for aviation professionals, pilots and others to upskill in areas of sustainability or climate change. Why did you want to offer this kind of programming? I thought this was important because while I'm an aviation person first, my research is in education, but specifically instructional design for online learning. And the reality is when you look across the industry today, that a lot of people have never encountered the concepts of sustainability or climate change. That I went to one of uh, the largest schools in the world for aviation. It was a university that was literally attached to the airport. So you'd go to class and then go flying and walk directly to the airplanes. And there was nothing that was an environmental class that was part of my curriculum whatsoever. And so I think there's this whole generation of, of leaders in the aviation space learning about this for the first time. In addition to that, I believe that although internationally aviation has set the goal of net zero by 2050, that I also I think it's a bit of a distraction to have a specific target because I don't believe sustainability has an end point. Right? Like it's not like we'll have a mission accomplished sign and we'll all celebrate, you know, we've achieved sustainability. I think it's a concept like safety that has to be integrated into every job and every day. You know, it has to always be something that's a consideration that you take in when you go to work. And so that creates a huge challenge because then how do you take the entire sort of working population in aviation and help them access um, accessible online education to support uh, that objective. So that's something that we thought would be really valuable that uh, WISA can support uh, to be in service to industry. We are hoping to launch uh, the first course in January and uh, all of the three uh, in total by the end of March 2024. That's coming up. Yes, uh, the FedDev uh, project has um, pretty inflexible timelines, so there's a whole lot of work <laughs> that's, that's being done, and all of us are, are targeting that end of March 2024 deadline. But when you talk about teaching them about sustainability, are we talking about the three pillars of sustainability, or are we just talking about environmental sustainability? No, nope, I'm talking about the three pillars. So what I did is, so I'd re previously written a textbook that's sort of an introduction to the entire aviation industry. And uh, every chapter is sort of a different sector. So it's regulators and then aircraft and airlines, general aviation. And so we modeled the course after the same template. So it's like from a regulatory context, what does the sustainability mean in the context of that job? And then in the aircraft design, manufacture, maintenance, what does sustainability mean in that context? So we tried to sort of deliberately build up this framework to help people understand that it's something all of us have to commit to and it's a part of every job. You didn't just create a textbook. It was my baby before wife. <laughs> true. <laughs> it's a very important textbook, a very well used textbook. Your textbook is called Fundamentals of International Aviation, and it is used around the world at multiple institutions. Yes, yeah, it's in uh, multiple translations. And, you know, I, I think a lot of people and I often will say this to students is, uh, you know, what drives you like, what's your goal. And I feel like mine is to support the next generation of aviation professionals in helping reshape the next generation of the aviation industry. And so that's why I think the textbook and WISA kind of go together. So why has it just had its second birthday? It's certainly changed as one would expect in two years. How would you characterize WISA now? Two years in. I think WISA, like all new things, I think is very much a startup. When we launched, it was sort of a passion project that's, you know, you're not quite sure how you're going to move forward. And every day is learning something new and, and meeting new people and having new discussions and ideas. But from the beginning, there was always this big dream. And the big dream was, can you imagine what we could accomplish if we could just tap all of these talented researchers and students on the shoulder and say, can you imagine applying your research to sustainable aeronautics? Like that, that was always the dream. And the Fed funding, I think, has completely changed our, our operations because it has really catalyzed that community and that momentum that was the dream that it all started with. We also have uh, some amazing staff. So I cannot tell, um, tell you enough how outstanding the, the WISA team is that I have uh, supporting this effort. I'm thankful for them every day. 
WISA does bring together researchers from all six faculties. How do you think that works at Waterloo? What's been really exciting about um, working with researchers across campus is that nobody has to work with WISA, right? Like nobody's obligated to, but I think that means that people who are excited or it speaks to them or they see a connection, then they they bring that excitement into WISA and, and that curiosity. And that has really allowed us to work with some really amazing people and start investigating things from new perspectives. And I think the other uh, real value add uh, that WISA tries to do is to connect our researchers to industry, um, to help them facilitate some of those conversations. Because I think industry and academia often can speak very different languages and and it can can present some challenges in in finding those points of intersection. So that's uh, been a real priority for us as well. Why specifically would Waterloo be a a good place for this sort of work? I think Waterloo is in a really unique position because while we have Canada's largest undergraduate pilot training program, we have hundreds of student pilots on campus, But historically, because we don't have an aerospace engineering program, I think even five years ago, people would say Waterloo doesn't do aviation, Waterloo doesn't do aerospace. But uh, what we found, particularly in the pandemic, is that a lot of the big challenges facing aviation were not traditional aviation challenges. They are, you know, advanced manufacturing or cybersecurity, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, mental health, physiology, like it, it's all of these other disciplines. And so a lot of, uh, as well, the origin of WISA is sort of looking across campus and saying, well, gosh, aviation already has lots of aviation expertise. Like, But imagine if they could tap into all of the diverse range of expertise we have on campus. So when you ask the question of why Waterloo, ultimately, we had so many strengths here at the university that were uh, exciting to apply towards aviation challenges. But it was also a proof of concept because we were one of the first, we believe maybe even the first sustainable aeronautics institute in the world. And we wanted to make sure that interdisciplinary researchers who didn't necessarily perceive them, themselves as aviation people would be willing to imagine applying their research to this domain. And I think that we have demonstrated uh, the value and the application of that. And as we look to the future of WISA, we're looking to increasingly expand the scope beyond the university and see if we can foster additional collaborations with other universities and, and build a broader network to continue this momentum. Oh, there's a lot of interdisciplinary work at Waterloo already. Mm-hmm. So when you when you ask them, do you feel like applying your research to sustainable aeronautics? What kind of reception did you get? Uh, I got an amazing reception. So before WISA, we had something called the Waterloo Aviation Research Cluster, and that was just uh, a half dozen faculty who had uh, happened to intersect and and were willing (laughs) to say, yeah, that sounds like a a good plan. And when I think the Institute was brought forward to Senate, I think we had 25 or so faculty. And and then, of course, when we had the FedDev funding, then our, our membership jumped up to 140 or 150. So it's been quite the ride. Um, but overall, like there's no lack of innovation. There's no lack of, of excitement and ingenuity on campus, that's for sure. On the topic of interdisciplinarity, the Collaborative Aeronautics Program, or CAP program, uh, gives grad students the chance to add aeronautics to their degree. And in the fall, the first student earned a Master of Applied Science in the program. Naomi Paul studied systems design engineering and trained in aeronautics in addition to her research work. How is CAP going? It's going great. Uh, so we're halfway through our second cohort now. And the the idea behind CAP was the same behind WISA, except it was from, of course, an educational perspective. It was, imagine if we can take interdisciplinary graduate students from all different disciplines, bring them together as a cohort and give them sort of foundational education in aviation and aerospace. And then in the second CAP course, they do a consulting project with industry, where industry actually comes in, gives them a problem, and the students work uh, collaboratively to produce a deliverable for industry. And then the third requirement for the CAP is the students apply their um, either their master's or doctoral work in some way towards aeronautics in a way that makes sense for their discipline. And then they graduate with their degree title enhanced with DASH aeronautics. So myself and Dr. Shirt Sao, who's the chair of the CAP committee, we had to go to individual departments one at a time and, and ask if they would be interested in adding uh, this option 
for their students. And our goal was to have at least one unit from each of the six faculties. And so we were able to achieve that goal. And a few new programs are joining just in the last few months as well. Well, I think the, the most exciting part about the CAP is where we are this year with this year's cohort. So we're maybe four months in since I met them. And what you can see is you can see the spark of this passion for aviation growing through the term. So as we're about to end this first semester, you know, when you look around the room, you're like, you're like, yes, this is exciting because they're starting to, that creativity is starting to come forward and they're starting to see the connections of their research to different aspects of industry and provide different opportunities. And I think also not only is what I I think the cap will be tremendously valuable to industry who's going to need a whole bunch of future talent right they they've set net zero by 2050 goals knowing that many of the technologies that we need to achieve those goals don't exist so how are we going to achieve them it's going to need all this future talent these new ideas and this new creativity so I think that uh, not only is this a benefit to students to give them an opportunity and a connection to industry where they might see themselves working but I also think it's a huge asset for industry as well. What's happening in the field of sustainable aeronautics now that excites you the most Suzanne? The word sustainability, what it really means is a focus on the future, right? It means we're making decisions today that will allow this industry to continue on. It's not lost on me the idea that these young people that I'm teaching who are passionate about aviation, that if we don't prioritize sustainability, it is their career that, that's going to be most impacted. So, so I think that's what's exciting to me is how much young people have embraced the concept of, of sustainability. And I feel like the all the different momentum and activity and all the research projects that are going on uh, are really illustrative that there is not one single solution to the sustainability problem. I look at it like a, like a mosaic, right? That there's probably hundreds or thousands of little points. And what we try to do is kind of just draw a circle around all those points and, and sort of put that picture out there to say, you know, it's going to take all of us. Like it is all going to, it's the sustainability problem is bigger than one organization, you know, one industry, one country, right? It's going to take everybody working together. And I think it's all about creating a future for the next generation. Thank you so much for being here, Suzanne. You're so busy, so I really appreciate you taking the time. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this interview from the Beyond the Bulletin podcast from the University of Waterloo. You will find our archive of full episodes on the University of Waterloo website. Select interviews are on the university's YouTube channel. Just look for our playlist there. Please join Brandon Sweet and me for new episodes. And don't forget to tell your Waterloo connections about us.